Good evening. It is not every day you have the opportunity to introduce an inspiration, freedom fighter, and modern day abolitionist. But today is that day. I believe the best way to honor our history is to make history. And our brother, Philip Agnew, has done just that. He served and was elected student body president at Florida A&M University. He received the prestigious Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Student Leadership Award. He's been recognized as a leader of this generation by Ebony Magazine and The Root. He's also the co-founder of the Dream Defenders, an organization committed to guiding students and young people through the fundamentals of nonviolent civil di disobedience, transformative organizing, and direct action. But to add on to that point, Brother Philip says this about the organization. We get young people, we are teaching them to be civically engaged. We are teaching them to stand up. The only way they're going to thrive in this society is if they take life by the reins and don't take no for an answer. When I consider his legacy and I consider the work that he has done throughout this nation, I'm reminded that Brother Philip Agnew represents a heart of justice. And why a heart, um, when we are resting and when we are sleeping, a heart is still working. That heart of justice that we saw in Ida B. Wells when people said slavery is over, progress is being made, but she said, no, my brothers and sisters are hanging from trees. I must say something. I must act. Or nearly 100 years later, when Mumia Abu-Jamal was sentenced to death in 1982, and people said his life was over, but no, he said, my life is just beginning. I'm going to organize from prison. I'm going to write, and I'm going to tell the truth about the American empire and how it's been oppressive to my people. And then our brother, Phil, who was working in Charlotte, decided to leave his job in Charlotte because he saw the oppression that was taking place in Florida and said, I must go back and organize and address the concerns of our people. And most recently, uh, before early voting began in Florida, he said these words. There are forces conspiring to steal our joy, preparing to sour the fruits of our labor. So we must remain vigilant and move with determination to win back all that was stolen from us. This is a beginning, not an end. The race doesn't end here. There's still more work to do. So before we bring our brother up, I want to ask for three things. The first, that we support our brother because we understand that what the fight he is in and the battle he's facing, that sometimes it's tough. But whatever we can do to support him, let's do that. Second, let's hear our brother. The hearing that matters is the hearing that listens eagerly, then believes, and then acts. Knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is power. And lastly, for those that are able, if you can rise to your feet and welcome our dear brother to South Carolina, Brother Philip Agnew. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you all hear me? Y'all can hear me well? I, I, I want to thank you for that introduction. Um, for, for a little while there, I was sitting down and just couldn't believe he was introducing me. <laughs> and there's another speaker. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, before I begin, I'm going to start off with a little call and response, something that we do within our organization, something that um, uh, whenever black people and people from the diaspora have gotten together, call and response is always there. So I just want you to repeat after me. It'll help me to soothe my nerves a little bit and then get about doing what you all have asked me to do. So repeat after me, power. Power. Transformation. Transformation. And miracles. Miracles. I want it. I want it. I need it. I need it. I got to have it. I got to have it. Right now. Right now. Power. 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 
power. Transformation. 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 A little bit of miracles. A little bit of miracles. I want it. I want it. I need it. I need it. I got to have it. I got to have it. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Thank y'all for indulging me. What a great, great honor it is to be invited to speak at a forum named for a man who should need no introduction. It is also a privilege to join past luminaries who have paved the way for me to serve in this capacity on this evening. It is a great joy of my life to be considered one whose thoughts are worthy of sharing with each of you all tonight. A longtime role model of mine, Harry Belafonte, when he's asked how he's doing, he always says, better than I deserve. <laughs> and I pray the same for each of you all tonight. The great French novelist Antoine de Saint-Exupéry once said, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Now, for those of you all who may not be familiar with early 20th century literature, <laughs> I present you all a slightly older but more familiar text from Proverbs 29, where there is no vision, the people perish. I've titled my comments for you all tonight, 2020 Vision, A Radical Tradition, A North Star. As we gather together in South Carolina, my state of Florida is in the midst of a recount. Most likely, after those votes are counted, we will have lost two hard-fought battles for governor and for Senate. A prominent attack during the campaign of Andrew Gillum by his opponent, Ron DeSantis, was that he was supported by our organization, the Dream Defenders, and that our platform was far too radical. They spent millions of dollars on ads calling us anti-police, anti-Israel, and anti-American. One of my favorites was a television ad that had really grim music and a really menacing voice. And it literally said, they want to take money from prisons and police and give it to social services. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're really evil, y'all. We're really, we're too radical. It was a great advertisement. It was quite apparent that the Trump-supported campaign of Ron DeSantis was afraid of our platform. That platform that we call the Freedom Papers is our vision for a future Florida that puts people before profits. It includes seven freedoms. It's designed after FDR's four freedoms. The freedom from poverty, the freedom from war and violence, freedom from police and prisons, a free flourishing democracy, freedom of mind, and freedom of movement. It establishes that the starting point in our discussion in Florida is universal rights to adequate food, shelter, clothing, water, health care, public transportation, dignified work and living wages. It's the starting point, not the finishing point. It's situated in the black, it's situated in the black radical socialist tradition. I want to read a little excerpt of how our papers begin. There are those that will tell you that corporations magically make this world go round. They'll tell you that businessmen keep the lights on and that they have the power to call on the sun and send it home at night. They'll tell you that developers bring life into this world, that their buildings can revive the blighted and make slums walk again. They'll tell you that bankers and investors are great angels from on high, that descend from heavenly penthouses with messages from the bank of God. They'll tell you that hell on earth is just a temporary pain to be eased in the bosom of their credit and their cars and their clothes and their customs. They'll tell you that they saved the day. They'll tell you that the real problem ain't them. The real problem is your man, is your woman, is that Haitian, or is that nigger, or that illegal, or is that redneck. And if we could just do away with them, we could all do big business better together. But we know better. We know about their eviction letters and rent hikes. We know about the cut hours, the unpaid overtime, the no insurance. We know about the crumbling schools, their police and prisons, and our empty wallets and refrigerators. 
We can build a state that gives raises to all public school teachers and bus passes to all our children. We can build a state that refuses to arrest our kids and provides health care for us all. If there's a police department, a liquor store, and a check cash in place, and our smoke shop on every block, why can't there be a public community center? We know who really saves the day. So why don't we praise the cook, the cleaner, and the cashier? Why don't we praise the bus boy, the bar back, the burger broiler, and the bus driver? Why don't we praise the waiter, the welder, and the dishwasher? Why don't we praise the maid, mother, and our children, and theirs? Why don't we praise the trash men, the last men to stand with King before he became a holiday? Our state wasn't built by businessmen. We built this state brick by brick with our bare hands, not Bank of America, not Carnival Cruise Lines, not the Miami Dolphins. We did this. The forgotten, the trafficked, and the disposed of. We are Florida's true power in life. And it's time we got our freedom papers. Now, the freedom paper situates itself in a long lineage of black radical thought, artists, and organizers that dare to put forth a plan beyond pragmatism and politicians. At every turn in our history in this country, we have been chided for being too naive and making bold demands. We've long been counseled to think practically, move a little bit more slowly, exercise patience as the world burns all around you. Dr. King, as he sat in the Birmingham jail, spoke to of opponents and fellow clergy who thought that his presence and his activities in their city was too radical was unwise and was untimely. As we speak today, the crescendo of fascism and white nationalism swells to ever higher heights. Europe, the United States, and now Brazil has fallen under the influence of right-wing ideologies and authoritarian leaders. And our side, our side still expects us to win from the center. We are already being so progressives. That's what I call progress. Progressives like Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and Cory Booker. I know. Centrist Democrats whose political records do not match their radical online brands. They are joined by billionaire barista Baron Howard Schultz, who will undoubtedly lead a campaign centering on conscious capitalism. And then possibly Hillary Clinton. And Bernie again. Who all they have to offer is they're four years older. We will not defeat fiery right wing extremism by appealing to a lukewarm center. A worldwide realignment is happening right now. The scenes that hold together the capitalist patchwork are once again pulling apart, as they will do. And we must, with haste, put forth a vision that tears it asunder not sows it up for future generations. I tell you, we are not going to win without a 2020 vision. It is our tradition. It is our inheritance. Power concedes nothing without a demand. And I'm going to tell you, bank black is not a demand. Stop killing us is not a demand. Body cameras is not a demand. More black officers is not a demand. An honest conversation about race is not a demand. The story, and dare I say legend, of Robert Smalls is a harrowing one. One listened to the tagline from his tale from escaped slave to ship pilot to captain to politician. You might expect a story filled with exaggeration. But I assure you that it is no exaggeration when I tell you we would not be here without the vision of one Robert Smalls. And I mean this on one hand, literally. It is said that he made his daring voyage to freedom aboard a stolen Confederate Army ship at 3 a.m. under the cover of darkness. I couldn't, I can't see nothing with that, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Guided, one must only assume, by the light of the North Star. We would not be here literally without Robert Small's impeccable sight in the dead of night. It don't get more literal than that. But a little less literal, but far more incredible was his foresight the planning, the daring nature of his vision. Imagine, if you will, that Robert Smalls had assembled a group of his closest liberal friends upon planning his escape. Imagine where we'd be today if he listened to them. Imagine where we'd be if he decided that instead of sailing to freedom, he would keep his head down, 
work hard and study to make a great overseer, and maybe one day own his own plantation. Imagine that instead of risking his life picking up the families of each of his crewmen, that he decided that the practical thing to do would be launch a fundraising campaign to free just his wife and kids. Imagine if instead of sailing for freedom, he would work to support Frederick Douglass. Why don't you just support Frederick Douglass and marvel at the progress that our country has made for great men like him? Imagine instead of, just, if, instead of sailing for freedom, he decided that he was just being selfish and foolish not thinking it through, and that his plan would mess it up for millions of slaves and just wanted to make a dollar. Imagine instead of selling for freedom, if he decided to just have faith. Imagine where we would be if he listened to them. Imagine where our children would be, will be if we listened to them. We cannot continue to allow a consolidation of black radical imagination around people and ideas that are comfortable at best, dangerous at worst. I say to you again that we will not win without 2020 vision. It is our tradition. It is our inheritance. Like Robert Smalls, we must not lose sight of a North Star. Another interesting note, it is said that Captain Smalls discussed his escape plan with everybody on the ship except for one person who he didn't trust. He knew then, he knew then, what well, many of us are learning, that there may be some people who with you on the ship, but they not about it, about it. <laughs> His lesson rings true today as we must stop being lulled into the shallow politics of representation, supporting people and ideas that don't share our radical, radical vision solely because they are black or because they are woman or because they are Democrat. For years, we have wandered the wilderness, working and waiting for a time such as this. We've watched as our votes, our family members, our wages, and our homes were stolen, all the while working and waiting for a time such as this. We've watched as our rents, our oceans, and our blood pressure rises, all the while working and waiting for a time such as this. Now here we are, gathered together, ever deep in the wilderness, and our ancestors and our great-grandchildren are asking, what are we going to do now? I came today to remind you that we've come very far, but still have so far to go. Now is not the time to settle into the safety of the center. Now is not the time to succumb to the numbness. Now is not the time to live vicariously through the lives of the black elite. Now is not the time to settle for political scraps and desperation. Now is not, not the time to act as individuals, angling for fame in the place of freedom. Only a radical vision will animate our people and prepare them to take back all that was stolen from us. I offer a few pieces of advice. I got some, some, some feedback that I don't, I, don't, I don't leave with enough. And I want to offer some pieces of advice for all of my, my peers. My folks who are in school, who grad school, who consider themselves young as I do, the sky listen to baby, and 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 because I try. I want you to remember to to in this time, it is required of you, and it is the only time at, at 33. I want you to know, college and this time that you have now is precious. I know everybody says that. I know it's Saturday afternoon special stuff. But this time is precious that you have here. In no other time will you be in such a concentration of people at least trying to do something. And so I want you to cherish it. I'd give anything to spend five more years on the campus of Florida a and University. Oh, the things I would do. Oh, the things I would not do. And so I wanna, I wanna give y'all a little bit here. I think first you all should join and participate in an organization that is made up of real live people. Not an online list. Join and participate in an organization that is made up of real, live, breathing, feeling, empathetic, soul-filled people. That organization must have a radical vision. 
You decide what that radical is. I've given an idea of what I think it is. That organization must have a radical vision. A feminist, internationalist, anti-capitalist political principles and must have the willingness and commitment to practicing those principles and building a membership base, attracting more live, breathing people. This organization must be contending for power. Don't join no group fighting hate. Hate is a ghost that you can't hit. Hate is a ghost that you cannot hit. You don't know when you're successful, when you're not. And they love it like that. Don't join an organization fighting racism. Join an organization that is contending for power, the power to decide our tomorrows. We can dream all we want. We can imagine all we want. But we want, our organization and any organization that you dedicate your time or even your life to must be dedicated to the power to determine our tomorrows, to make manifest your greatest and wildest dreams. Without the power to do that, it's just an exercise in theater. Second, do not be fooled by personalities who want you to believe that black and Latino success in media, in politics, in business, and technology is a stand-in for liberation. Be happy for Jay-Z. Be happy for him. But that's not freedom. Representation ain't gonna save us. Representation will not save us. Third, study. Study. Now, I would like you to read, but I get it. Watch a YouTube video. Check out a Netflix documentary. Pop in an audio book. Do whatever you have to do to die. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. And what you consume and what you give your body and your mind shows up in your practice and what you do with people and how you run your organization and how you move about in this world. And so I ask you, please, take time to study because there's nothing new under the sun except you. And so there's probably an organization or people, 100% a woman, who has done this before, who has thought about it, written about it, and left you a parable inside of a book for you to read and not do it all over again. Take time to study and take time to reflect. Think every day that you can about what is the impact of what I've done today. Reflect, recalibrate. Fourth, use strategy. I'm not against protests, but some of the protests we're doing, God, why fold? What? I, I don't understand. If it's not attached to a strategy, right, that is in the pursuit of building power for our people, it is once again an exercise in theater. And there's no, listen, I'm all about theater, theater of the oppressed. But name it that. Don't name it a direct action. Don't name it civil disobedience, your well-placed choreography and your pictures and your bail fund, right? Strategy. And what comes with strategy is something that people say is a kind of a, a, a way, a framework to think about it. Time, place, and condition. Look to your neighbor and say, time, time. Place, place, and condition. You can't copy and paste something you saw from another organization and just put it in the context of where you live. Miami is not Colombia. Colombia is not Shreveport. West Colombia, not Colombia. <laughs> Time, place, and condition. Bring strategy. Yes, yeah, somebody might have a great idea a world away that you saw, but it's that praxis. It is a dialectic, right, that allows you to prove a theory and bring it into your context and see if it's truly successful. You understand what I'm saying? Really? Okay. And number five, don't forget to dance. We party. We party. Go, go to my Instagram. It's mostly party pics. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good balance, like family, party, right? What is a movement without music? You don't think people in the community know things are bad? 
You don't think people in the community already know how horrible things are when they come to your meeting, everybody crying? Everybody arguing? Right? So how can we build organizations filled with joy? Not fake joy, right? But don't forget to dance, to move, to revel in the magic of being against, being with your sister, or your brother, your sibling, right? Don't forget that in your organization. To build a boat, we must make our people long for the sea. Not a seat on the boat, but the sea. I ask each of us as we leave here today to consider the power if we move together with 2020 vision. Because we're going to need 2020 vision to ensure that we free our people from their prisons. We're going to need 2020 vision to loose our people from the chains of poverty. We're going to need 2020 vision to liberate our children's minds and spirits. We're going to need 2020 vision to save our neighborhoods from their high rises and their parking lots and their coffee shops. We're going to need 2020 vision to end the trafficking and the war and the violence against our women and girls and the destruction of our planet. We're going to need 2020 vision if this group of people in here and people around the country ever hope to save the soul of it. Each of us was chosen for this time and this place. We were hand selected by the creator to move this world forward. Robert Smalls lived a vision. At every turn, he dared to envision a life worth living, not just for him, not just for the families of the 17 crew members that joined him on that harrowing evening, but for each and every one of us. He may not have seen our faces but I can absolutely assure you when he laid his head on the pillow at night, he knew that his feet would be felt for many, many years. He never knew that maybe there would be a little lecture series and for the 21st one, they'd invite this short guy to come <laughs> and yell and talk bad about people. <laughs> but he knew that what he'd done was not just for him. I want to end my time with y'all with two quotes that I love, both by Marcus Garvey. He says, look for me in the whirlwind of the storm. Look for me all around you. For with God's grace, I shall come back with countless millions of African men and women who have died in America, those who have died in the West Indies, and those who have died in Africa to aid you in the fight for life, liberty, and freedom. He says, we have a beautiful history. We have a beautiful history. The one we will create in the future will astonish the world. Thank you. Um, well, I said this, in the, who was in the class with us earlier? Okay, so I, 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 wanna, I wanna say it, uh, though maybe it, it, it doesn't require it. I'm not the authority here. I'm gonna give you uh, answers based on a litany of failures um, and hope that they help. Um, you know, I think, it, I was having a conversation, um, you, all, you all know Stanley Nelson. Great, doc great filmmaker, and he made a film about black media, actually, um, and the decline of black media. I'm from Chicago, Chicago Defender, um, the Miami Times. Uh, you know, most cities have black media. And so what, what my answer to you actually is going to be different. I think most people would probably say that your role as a journalist 
is to be objective. Um, to tell the facts as you see it and tell all sides of the story. I'm gonna lay myself bare before all of you all and say that I believe in propaganda. Well, no, listen. Um, I, I think an objective discourse warrants um, uh, both sides playing in that game, in that arena. And I think we need black journalists more. We have them, Yamish. We, we've got a number of people who have now come under attack by the president, um, who maybe aren't read as much as they should be. Um, uh, Charles Blow, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, some of his pieces. Um, we have a number of people that are doing this, but we need black journalism who is willing to speak from a, a more leftist perspective. Um, and, and, and that's my personal answer. I, it's all, always open for disagreement. But as a journalist, your role is ever more important to present a view of the world that is analyzed not just from the economic point of view of the right, uh, from the cultural point of view of the right. The right presents the media and presents news in the way that it wants to. And not just Fox News, which is far and away, I, I just found this out, far and away the most popular news network in the country. I had no idea about that, actually. I thought they were fringe, I'm not going to lie. They are more than the next two combined, right? So Fox News is not fringe, right? So if we're looking at it as scales, we're unbalanced, and we need somebody tipping over here. Um, and so I think that is a role. Your activism, your work, your ability to analyze and, and dissect the issues, the important issues of the day for young people, right? For not just black people, but for poor people across the country is essential in this time. We have lost the ideological war. And when I say we, I'm talking about leftists. That's, that's who I am. You know, I, you all knew that. <laughs> um, we lost, we stopped fighting the ideological war and we have ceded it completely to the right. And that's why we continue to get politicians and rhetoric and platforms that are center left at best. Because they're able to talk from their crazy house to the right and then call everything that's just a smidget away from that radical. And so I think that is an important place. I think journalism is an essential vehicle and motor of a democracy. And um, we're not getting accuracy in many places, um, and definitely not one that relates to the life and experience of many of the people in this room, who I assume are in this room. Is that, I'm willing to talk later, too. As y'all can see, I can ramble. Do I call on people? I'm sorry. Is there a mic? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm loud. <laughs> so I've noticed that when stuff happens on campus or around Columbia, a lot of people just like to be mad. And one of the points you said was, um, I wrote it down. So protests about strategy is pretty much just theater. So how do you begin organizing a large group of people to direct that anger into something that's actually going to cause change? Well, anger is just. You know, and I, we've, we've, all, we've said it before, a anger is a, a valid emotion. Rage is on the spectrum of things that human beings feel. Um, but in my experience, this is eight or nine years of doing this thing that I do. Anger is not enough to continue an organization. Anger will consume you, you individually and will consume the structures of accountability, et cetera, within the organization. Um, what, what I would say is uh, we just started to begin to have what we internally would consider a modicum of success after about six years. You know? Um, in the business world, they used to say that you do not have the hope of breaking even before five years, three to five years. I say that because um, this is going to take a long time. So <laughs> something happens on campus, people are angry. They assemble somewhere for a protest, um, an uprising, or whatever may happen. There needs to be folks, I, I believe you and other people, who are there getting everybody's information there at that, who, who came, with a clipboard or an iPad, getting everyone's information. After that protest is over, you send everyone in there an email asking them for their Twitter, their Instagram, and anything else how they would like to be communicated with. 
and you, can, you, you, you try the best you can in that moment, they call them whirlwind moments, uh, uh, ironically, uh, whirlwind moments, you try as best you can to begin to build a scaffolding and find the few, because it will always be few. It was never, them pictures look amazing, but those pictures were the product of a bunch of meetings with two or three people, right? And so you try to get the information for a few people who are dedicated, right? And then you all start talking to people in concentric circles. You, you, do you kind of get what I'm saying? It's just really abbreviated, right? It's a whole lot of work. And then the moment dies away, but you all don't, right? And then inevitably, because you live in South Carolina, something else is going to happen, <laughs> right? But this time, it's not just you and your friend with the clipboard. It's about six of you, right? And then the six of you, it's, you know what I'm saying? Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I think what happens is people get really dejected because they met somebody at that march who was like, I'm down for this for the rest of my life. And they didn't, they, they didn't call you back. They didn't. And you're like, yo, everybody is just full of, you know what I'm saying? Everybody, this is some bullshit. Why am I, you know what I'm saying? I thought you was down. You gave them, you did a poem. Like, I really thought you was about. And so that's what happens. So we need people who have a long game in sight. Um, for me, I'll tell you, six years in, that has resulted in me being at very angry places and being like, <laughs> hey, you, what are you, <laughs> you know, I, you know, and that, that's what will happen, but that's what it's going to take. You, do you get what I'm saying? Okay. side was the mother of the church. My dad was assistant pastor. My mom did the youth choir, um, led the choir, was a soloist. I was the drummer. My cousin was the organist. Uh, my father drove the church band. We, we, it is a part, it is, you know, I, you, you, it is one of the reasons next to maybe even music that I am able to present myself in a cohesive manner that is a little bit above Ben Stein. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am, that church is, is a part of me. I, I want to really quickly speak to the, of course, the conservative nature of church, um, how they view um, the LGBTQ community, right? It, it, it just always blew my mind. It, you know, you have a pastor that talk, you know, rail against gays, and then right next to him, the choir, uh, direct, like, that choir director, I'm not assuming, but your discernment seemed to be a little, but you, so, so there are contradictions aplenty in the church. What, what, I, what I see actually as the, the dominating threat to the integrity of the church is the conservatism we've come to understand it as just church people. Uh, uh, people who say, people who say uh, we, we've got to wait because, you know, they believe that we, please forgive me, I, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but there are some people in the church that believe that 
uh, heaven after we die is worth living in hell on earth, right? Um, but prosperity gospel, right? The advent of a theology that pretends that, that, that says that you are, if you are poor, then you are distant from God's love. Do you understand? Maybe you haven't heard them say that, but you have heard them say that if you are wealthy, you are close to God's love, right? God has opened up the windows of heaven and poured me out a blessing in a jet that I have not room to receive, right? Right? So the logic of if you are wealthy, then you are within God's favor is if you are poor, then God has turned his back on you. You are not praying hard enough. You are not doing hard enough, right? And I think prosperity gospel in concert with the very real conservative thread in all of our churches has been a, a, a great supporter and upholder of what I view as the capitalist, the neoliberal project, right? Right? That says, um, for, you know, uh, we've got ministers that will refuse actually to engage in a political process, right? Because of connections. And then I've been to small towns where pastors are over fiefdoms, right? They might as well be the mayor and the sheriff. And they not, when, once you come in that church and talk about, and hellfire and brimstone, they're like, listen, no, not in, not in Pahokee, bro. You know, you're not bringing that over here. And so we've got, there, there also must, we also must recognize that we are not going to change the institution of the church if all of us young people, including myself, turn our back on it. Right? Um, the black church was and probably for the foreseeable future will be one of the greatest institutions in the black community, right? And I do that, you know why I do that. It's, we're, we're diverse. Um, it's still brick and mortar, real estate, if you wanna go, you know, go to that, but also the power and the influence of the infrastructure. And so I would say for anybody, I'm 33, 33 and under who has turned their back on the church, uh, I'm, I gotta practice what I, Preach. Um, we th there there must be a movement within the church to move it and to identify the fact that churches serve as an arm of empire right now to assuage people to tranquilize people to preach patience patience and caution um, and that's not God that's not Jesus right Jesus was a revolutionary right. Jesus was a radical. Um, and uh, this goes for all faiths, right? Um, Hillel said, what, he said, if, if I be for myself, then who will be for me, right? If, I'm, I'm, I'm messing apart in the middle, and then he says, if not now, when? Am I right? And so in any tradition, faith tradition, there is a radical thread that necessitates the destruction of this project that we're living under, right? They cannot coincide. If you believe in your text, they cannot coincide. They are, not, they are strange bedfellows, right? And so we all have a duty as people who go to church, who worship in church, who believe in the institution as a great grounding body and a great scaffolding for, for our lives and maybe for our souls. We've got a duty to challenge it when we see it. We can, you know, this is not a sideline sport. So since we're in church, <laughs> can you talk a bit about how the black church has been co-opted or has aligned itself more and more with this very um, white um, fundamentalism and to the extent to where, for example, you know, they're, they're embracing some of this um, Jewish idea of, of, you know, they have to get rid of the Palestinians or the, the second coming. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, I mean, because it's one thing, you know, No, 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 no. I, and I, I think I attempted to, to correct the language. We're talking specifically about Zionists, not Jewish folks, and it is. It's Christian fundamentalists. 
is evangel the evangelical right that not only believes, uh, I, I, I actually, I'm gonna say I don't know, um, particularly where the evangelical right um, stands on the question of Palestinians, but I do know they, they, they believe that all Jewish people returning to Israel when the, would, would begin the second coming. Am I correct? That is what they believe. Okay. That. Exactly. Exactly. Paradoxically. Okay. I I I I love to continue the conversation and be better educated on the subject. The extent to what I know is that they are they have a, a most perverse ideology that allows them to stand tall and be supported for standing up for Israel um, solely that, so, so it, will be, it will begin the destruction of all Jewish people in their belief. I mean, I don't want to focus on the Jewish stuff. I'm okay. Saying, I'm just the black church. To understand how that, can, if you can talk about how some of that has happened, that right, that shift. The, um, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. no, no um, let me get my words correct here. It, 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 to me, it goes back to, to my previous statement about us losing in the ideological war. And, and what I mean is, um, in a vacuum, we have allowed for folks in a really wide umbrella, but a, with right-wing ideologies that at best are problematic, right? At worst, diabolical, right? Um, to guide and be the center of all conversation. And so I say this when we're organizing and we're talking to young, young kids and they're like, yo, you're racist to me. You keep talking about this race stuff, but I don't see that in my school. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got used, I'm friends with, I'm friends, I'm talking in how they, I'm friends with this chick on, I'm friends with this white, like we don't, you bringing that racism stuff to me is racist. And you're like, how does that happen? Wait. How does, how does this happen? Or, or even we talked about it earlier with Blexit, right? The black exit from the Democratic Party, how they're able to create a whole analysis of the world that says, you all should leave the Democratic Party because Republicans are the ones that historically stood up for you after slavery. Not even talking about who was Republicans at that time. Oh, uh, Lincoln was, a, you know, and, and, and Frederick. So in the absence of a, a bravery on our part, not to teach, but to be bold in it, to, to generate mass education pro projects. Um, we have allowed what I consider our opposition to guide the entirety of the conversation. And so then you do have, we talked about it earlier, we have hoteps, hoteps, right, who are now aligned with white extremists, right? And you say, how does this union happen at all and I think it's because there's no fulcrum, there's no balance on the other side of the scale. And so people are taking ahistorical bits and pieces of random YouTube videos, bits and pieces of faux scholars who have followings on the internet, right? Uh, half truths, Moynihan studies, right? And cobbling together an ideology that affects not just um, our movements, but our religious institutions, right? There is an absence, and we have to re-engage ourselves in the cultural, what I believe is a cultural war, the battle for hearts and minds, the battles of ideas, how the world is constructed, how it is seen, how it is viewed, and how God is seen and constructed. And in the absence of that, I think that's a part of what I would say is the reason we see uh, black churches aligning with the most perverse of white evangelical doctrines and then lastly, I grew up in a church where, you know, we believed that we were the children of Israel and, you know, it was, we didn't, we didn't at that, I didn't at that time think that was a, polit, a, a harmful thought um, or an incorrect thought, for sure. You know, my mom taught me that. You, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and so we need more people who are able to, to, to to bring a cohesive and a tangible and a palatable analysis of the world um, so that people can start to put pieces together in, in an arrangement that is true.